Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. All right, welcome to another episode of The Matchup. I'm Ben Ladner, joined by Seth Tao as always. And Seth, we are uh, communicating via phone this time again. We are both on spring break in our respective locations. Me here in Atlanta, Georgia, my, my hometown. Where are you this week again? I'm staying in Hollywood, Florida right now. Oh, wow. That's, is it, how much different is that from Hollywood, California? Very. Okay. I mean, the weather, I assume, is pretty similar. Because okay, it's, that's nice. It's nice and warm down here. But yeah. There is a Hollywood Boulevard here, which threw me off at first when I saw it. But well, yeah. nice. Yes. Yeah, so nice so you and I, you and I will both be in Chicago. Uh, I guess tomorrow. Or are you headed up tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Today's Tuesday, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, tomorrow afternoon I'm flying back. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be making the the twelve to thirteen hour drive from Atlanta Ooh. to Bloomington to Chicago tomorrow. Uh, we will convene with uh, the great Michael Dugan of the assembly call and three of us will be covering the big 10 tournament. So kind of in preparation for that, I wanted to, uh, to, to get an episode in here for uh, Indiana's upcoming matchup in the big 10 tournament against Ohio state. And, you know, this is a game where obviously these two teams have seen one another. It, it's not an instance where it's a third matchup because they only met once in the regular season. And frankly, it was one of the weirder games of the year. I mean, maybe you take out that Michigan game where Indiana just couldn't hit a shot. Um, I mean, even some of those Michigan state and Wisconsin type games, Iowa, I mean, even those to me at least made a little bit more sense than this Ohio state game. This was just a a weird contest all around. Neither team played particularly well. And so it's one of those where you can kind of look at it and maybe take some things away, but All in all, you know, I I think this is going to be a completely different style game than we saw the first time. I think both these teams are in a better place than they were uh, when they met back in February. And, um, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think this is maybe the the best matchup Indiana could have hoped for when you look at who they could have possibly faced in the first round of the bracket. Um, But but it's still going to be a tough one all the same. Yeah, I completely agree. When you bring up that first game they played, I think there's a case that that could have been the worst, aside from Michigan, I think that could have been the worst game they've played this season. I guess Michigan and Minnesota are the only other two that really stand out. But, you know, it was a close game, but neither team really played particularly well. And it's not like, you know, they lost to Purdue 48-46 to at home. But at least that one you could say, oh, they, they had a really, really good defensive effort in that game. Right. What can you? I, there's nothing I can really point to from that Ohio State game that oh they did this well that's why it was close. I think it was just a total struggle of a rock fight between both of these teams the first time they played. Yeah, and and it's it's easy to kind of look at that game and say okay well you know neither team's offense was very good but the defense was fine and statistically that's true but I actually didn't even think the defense was all that good for either team. I, I just think both teams missed shots. I mean Juwan Morgan in that game he had one of his worst offensive games of the season. He was one of seven. Um, and that, that was actually kind of the start of him kind of going into that little slump that he was in for, you know, the last few games there until uh, Illinois and, and, and uh, Rutgers to close the season. Uh, so I, even defensively, I didn't think either team really played all that well. Indiana had a few uh, defensive breakdowns that led to Ohio State buckets, namely on the last play of the game uh, when Chris Holtman really smartly kind of leveraged Indiana's hard hedging defense against it and got a backdoor dunk for Andre Wesson. Uh, Indiana did only turn the ball over 15 times that game. So yeah, that's something maybe you look for, to as a positive, but again, so many possessions were just ending in missed shots that actually got 10 turnovers for turnovers for Indiana that game. That's right. That's right. They, Ohio state had 15, Indiana had 10. Um, Ohio state closed the game on a six Oh run. Like I said, kind of just took advantage of the Hoosiers defense uh, in that last you know, few possessions there. That was, that was a game. I, I guess if you're going to point to maybe one bright spot for Indiana, I think Deron Davis and Devonte green both played pretty well in that game. And that was when it started to become clear that, you know, they give this team a little bit different element. I think after that Michigan state game, 
it was it was kind of a, a thing. You know, it became interesting. Like, okay, Duran and, and Devonte are kind of giving this team a different look. And I thought both those guys actually played all right in that game. You know, again by that by that game standard, I, I don't think anyone played particularly well. But by that game standard, I think both guys played okay. Uh, Duran Davis just kind of gives that team a different look, and I think he did in that game. Had a couple of assists. Devonte had three assists. Um, so those two guys maybe could be, you know, people who who make Indiana a little bit more dynamic against Ohio State. But all in all, like I said, I think it's just two different teams in two different places than they were in that first matchup. Um, so so I don't know that there's necessarily a correlation between how those two guys played in that last game and how they'll play on Thursday. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean Indiana was without its depth for so long, and yeah. even though they had Devonte Green and Deron Davis available in that game. They have even more depth available now, and it, as Race Thompson has kind of averse, emerged into a potential bench option, Evan Fitzner only played three minutes in that game, and I think he's enjoyed a little bit of a late season resurgence to where he can play a little bit more of a role off the bench if needed for Indiana. I mean, D- Demise Anderson played a couple minutes in that game. I doubt that he sees the court unless something bad happens. Me too. I mean, Indiana just has a lot more. They're, they're able to switch guys out a lot more. I don't think they need Romeo Langford to play 38 minutes a game like right. he did in that Ohio State game. They obviously need high minutes from him, but not 38 minutes a game. And I mean, Jawan Mor- yeah, that was one of Jawan Morgan's worst games of the season offensively. And he still managed to come down with 14 rebounds, still finding ways to make an impact. But then you look at Ohio State, they just t- kind of tailspinned over the la- over towards the end of the season. They lost four of the- out of their last five to end the season. And it had a lot to do with Caleb Wesson's injury. Yeah. Caleb, Caleb Wesson was so important to that team. And when you take him out of that lineup, they just lose so much. And it was so clear. I mean, you look at that. The last game they won what is the last game that Wesson played when they beat Iowa 90-70. to 70. And Caleb, and you take Wesson out of that lineup and just look at the scores of that game. They lost to Wisconsin in overtime their last game, 73-67. to 67. But that was the most points they scored in those three games. They lost to Northwestern 68-50. to 50. And Northwestern is terrible. <laughs> and they got blown out by Purdue 86-51. to 51. So they've just been in, in an absolute nosedive since Weston's gone down. And he's a, the reports are saying he's going to play on Thursday, which is big for Ohio State. Yeah, and, and also, you know, Weston is kind of, he's, I think, he obviously easy, the, easily the most talented player on that team. And I think a really important piece because he's able to tie together a lot of their other talent. You know, as as kind of that centerpiece down low, he's what allows guys like C.J. Jackson, Luther Muhammad, Andre Wesson, guys like that to kind of be effective in their roles and, and play a little bit more complementary roles. You mentioned the, uh, the the depth for Indiana and Romeo playing so many minutes. I think we'll probably see Al Durham for more than 29 minutes. I, I would almost be certain that we'll see Rob Finnessy for more than 27. That was kind of when he was still recovering from that that concussion that he had, and he he only went two of nine from the field, played 27 minutes, no assists, two personal fouls. He just was kind of a non-factor in that game, as was Al Durham. So, you know, Archie Miller was kind of struggling to find any kind of depth in that game. Justin Smith only played 24 minutes. I imagine we'll see more of him. Um, so I, I think because of that, I would, like you said about Ohio State, how their season's kind of been in this downward spiral recently, and Indiana's been going in the exact opposite direction. I would guess that Indiana would win this game. I think they're the more talented team. I think they're playing better right now. Um, but again, you know, both these teams have been so volatile over the course of the season. Ohio State's had some good wins. Indiana's had some bad losses and vice versa. Uh, so it's, it, it's kind of a difficult thing to project because, you know, it, it could really go either way. And, you know, we haven't seen Indiana really sustain this hot stretch of play. I mean, it's been four games, but you, you'd like to see them put together a string longer than that. And so I don't know if I totally believe or, or trust them to, you know, carry carry this uh, this positive momentum forward and just come out and beat Ohio State by you know ten or fifteen points the way they probably should. Um, but at the same time, you know, they very well could because they're playing their best basketball of the season right now. Yeah, and I mean, you you mentioned Justin Smith and Rob Benesey, and those are two guys. Again, they didn't play all that. They played fine. Justin Smith was fine in that Ohio State game. But those two guys have become big factors in Indiana's resurgence, especially Rob Fennessy. He, since he's become healthy, he's just returned to his early season form where he was kind of a key cog on this offense, the thing, the, the guy that makes everything tick. And he's just been so good. 
Like, in, like he's been a the difference. I, you could argue he's been the difference maker in Indiana, turning this thing around because they really lacked that kind of steady point guard. It, Archie Miller called him rock steady in a press conference. They really lacked that kind of rock steady presence at point guard when he was injured and recovering from an injury, and you know that hurt them in this Ohio State game. But he's just been so much better since he's kind of really recovered and been healthy. I, I think he's a key player, and you're, I do tend to agree with you that Indiana is the more talented team, but you know, they also, there's also a bit of a track record with Indiana at the Big Ten tournament, and you know, they come in with a four-game win streak, but all of a sudden now, you know, they, three of those four games were at Assembly Hall. They won one tough game at Illinois that turned out to be the offensive, <laughs> the, the offensive explosion game, yeah. and you know, but now they're taking this to a neutral site can they keep this momentum going at a neutral site? I, th- I think that's an interesting point as well. Yeah, you talked about Finnessy. I think not only could you argue that he's been the difference maker, I would argue that, and in fact will argue that in a piece I have coming out tomorrow on Rob Finnessy uh, on InsideTheHall.com, nice so you plug. can check that out. Yep, there you go. I had to, had to work that in somewhere. By the way, you mentioned uh, Archie Miller using the term rock steady. Is he a Jamaican music fan? <laughs> You'll have to ask him. I don't know. I, I, maybe I'll ask him in the press conference. <laughs> um, anyway, where was it? That, that totally threw me off my train of thought. Anyway, um, <laughs> one guy I wanted to touch on was, was um, Luther Muhammad. And, and kind of, I guess, just maybe Ohio State's wing tandem at large. Luther Muhammad, Musa Jalo, uh, Dwayne Washington Jr. even a little bit, who played 16 minutes in that game. Keyshawn Woods played 16 minutes in that game, he's a little bit more of a, of a guard, not quite as much of a wing. Um, and the reason I bring them up is because not only did Luther Muhammad, I think, play really well at, at certain points in that game. He wasn't, you know, super efficient, nine points on 10 shots. But uh, I thought he hit some really big shots. I thought he played really hard, and I thought he played good defense. And so I'm curious, you know, with, with the way Romeo Langford's played here recently, he had a pretty good game even uh, in that first matchup. But I'm curious to see what Ohio State kind of does with him, how they attack him. You know, do they try to funnel him inside toward Wesson and, and use him as a rim protector? He's been prone to foul trouble this year, so I don't know if that's the most viable strategy because, you know, you're almost just inviting guys to attack your foul-prone big man, and that gets him out of the game. Do they try to just play him straight up with one guy? Do they give him a bunch of different looks? And then if so, you know, how does Indiana – maybe work the ball around who, who becomes that secondary penetrator. You mentioned Finnessy. I think he's a good candidate for it. Um, and then I'm also interested to see um, if Juwan Morgan can kind of carry his senior day performance into the Big Ten tournament because as well as he's played, you know, the, the entire season, I think he's a, a, a second-team All-Big Ten caliber uh, guy this season. As well as he's played, he hasn't really been the efficient scorer that we've become accustomed to seeing you know, basically since, I guess, the mid-season mark. I don't know exactly when his efficiency started to tail off, but um, I think it was a good sign to see him kind of get back in the flow of things on senior day because they Indiana, if they're going to go far, you know, in the Big Ten tournament, the NCAA tournament, whatever their postseason holds, if they're going to have any kind of success, they're going to need him to be an efficient scorer in addition to a great rebounder, which he's been, a great passer, which he's been, a great defender, which he's been. But they're going to need that scoring element to kind of come back here. Yeah, I agree. But I think Indiana is also made up for it by some other guys who were not previously seen as efficient scoring types, quote unquote, turning into efficient scorers. Nate, the guy I key in on with there is Devontae Green, because he, at t- through most of his career, was just this inefficient guy who could occasionally drill some shots, but was so high energy and would just, he, he'd either lift the team up big time or drag them down big time. And I feel like a lot of the times people would only see the drag them down big time, but he's been really good lately. And I mean, he's turning like the last two games against Rutgers, he was six for eight for 16 points. I mean, can you really ask for more than that from Devontae Green? He was four for six for 11 points at Illinois. He's turned into an efficient scorer that Indiana's needed, especially off the bench for so much of this season. Yeah. And I think having Rob Finnessy back really helps, you know, helps, helps Green to kind of simplify his, his role because He's not being asked to make quite as many decisions. He's not, you know, as a result, he's not forcing as much on offense because he's, he's, he can just kind of be more of a slasher and a shooter. And, you know, he still kind of does his Devontae Green things where he'll pull up for three uh, on a break with, with a guy or two in his face. And, you know, Archie Miller typically yanks him if he does stuff like that. <laughs> but he's cut back on that sort of thing the last couple of games, like you said. 
And it's been really good uh, to, to see him kind of just find a role in the rotation as opposed to being kind of his own thing within the rotation. Yeah. Um, so I had one turnover in those last two games. Yeah. And that's, that's maybe the biggest thing is not only is he cutting down on the bad shots, but he's also turning the ball over less. So that, that's a, that's basically like cutting down your turnovers in two different ways. Uh, and, and like I said, sometimes it just felt like this season, he was kind of off doing his own thing, kind of, you know, I don't want to say detached from the team, but it, he didn't seem to be quite as, you know, integrated into the team's flow and their rhythm to the extent that they had any during, during some of those mid season games, he just, he kind of seemed to be struggling to find his place. And I think he's found it now. And I think uh, Deron Davis has helped with that. I think just those two guys coming off the bench and being that really dynamic tandem uh, as, as the sixth and seventh men, I think having Rob Finnessy back healthy helps him. I think Romeo Langford starting to knock down some jumpers and come into his own as a scorer uh, is really helping with him with, with that uh, for green. And, you know, it's, it's always tough to trust Devonte green, you know, to sustain this kind of thing for a long stretch. He could just as easily, you know, come out and, and go one for nine in the big 10 tournament, which I'm not saying he will, but we've seen that sort of thing happen before. So uh, I do think that if he can be that kind of third score, maybe fourth option, then it gives Indiana a dynamic weapon that Ohio state just can't match. You know, Indiana, if all their guys are kind of playing up to snuff and all of Ohio state's guys are playing up to snuff, I just think Indiana has more weapons and that could maybe be what pushes them over the edge in this game. I tend to agree with you on that. I think Indiana's just got more weapons, uh, even when with Caleb Wesson in there, which does open up a lot for Ohio State. I think that Indiana's depth will, is better than Ohio State. I think their best players are better than Ohio State's best players. And I think as long as they can manage Wesson defensively and not let C.J. Jackson heat up from downtown, I think Indiana will win this game. Yeah, one other thing I wanted to, to touch on was that I thought Ohio State's size and their physicality was able to give IU, a, you know, not a ton of problems, but some problems in that first game, you know, with, with Juwan Morgan playing the five going up against Caleb Wesson, who was just huge. You know, Morgan wasn't really able to get to his spots and, and get his shots off the way that he usually does. And I thought Ohio State did a really good job bringing extra defenders, forcing kickout passes. That was during that time in the season where opponents were just daring Indiana to shoot from the outside. And IU started to knock down a few more of those shots recently, and opponents aren't doing that strategy to the same degree that they used to. But I really thought that, that Ohio State's size was a big factor, and maybe that's where you look to just kind of go at Caleb Wesson early on in the game, see if you can get him in foul trouble, because beyond him, Ohio State doesn't really have a ton of size. You know, they've got Kyle Young who comes off the bench. They'll play Jaden Ledee as kind of a, you know, a 4-5 type of guy, but he only played three minutes in that first game. So beyond Caleb Wesson, who, you know, number one, has some conditioning issues, I think, that, that prevents him from playing major minutes. And number two, has some foul trouble issues that, that keep him from playing major minutes. Those could be pockets of the game where he's out that, I mean, Indiana could go to that, that front court tandem of Deron Davis and Jawan Morgan and maybe just, just try to use their size against Ohio State. Or maybe you just go to Morgan at the five, kind of try to bring him outside, pull Caleb Wesson with him. And use Morgan's, you know, speed and craftiness off the dribble. I don't know exactly how they'll attack that, but I did notice that in that first game, Ohio State's size seemed to kind of perplex Indiana for the early portion of the game. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think when you look at Ohio State's roster and just beyond Caleb Wesson, the, their most effective forwards, not even just big men, their most effective forwards are two small forwards and, and Justin Arns and Andre Wesson. Yeah. So I think when you are able to neutralize Caleb less and I think you do take away a, a, a big inside element of that game and Indiana can't exploit that with Dewan Morgan and Deron Davis you're completely right you think we see any race Thompson in this game uh, maybe I think I don't know how well he's gonna match he's I don't know I'm not sure I, I guess I'm gonna say no because I, I'm not sure how good of a defensive matchup it's gonna be for him in this game and he I, I don't think he offers enough offensively yeah. to where especially knowing that Ohio, like how Ohio State defended Indiana last time. I just don't know how well he would fit into the game plan for this particular matchup. That's fair. I think I probably agree, but I will say Ethan Happ was 0 of 6 against Race Thompson, and Rutgers' big guys struggled to score on him. Just throwing That's that fair. out there. I think he's the best post defender on this team already. Um, so, uh, you know, again, it's probably a case where if, if someone gets in foul trouble, maybe you go to him. Yeah, right. I, I don't I know. Think, I think he's the big man option off the bench. But I 
think in, as long as Jawan Morgan and Deron Davis are able to manage it, manage their fouls effectively. And that we've seen throughout their careers, that's been a big if, uh, yeah. you know, as long as they're able to manage it effectively, I, I don't know that race Thompson that is a necessity in this game. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're giving me the options of race Thompson, Evan Fitzner, Clifton Moore and Jake Forrester, the latter two have, have kind of fallen out of the rotation here. If you're giving me those options, I'd probably go with Clifton Moore. But, you know, it could be a matchup thing if they're if no one's shooting the ball well and they need some some outside presence to space the floor. Maybe you throw in Fitzner. I don't know exactly how they'll handle that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to see Thompson, you know, especially if the game isn't close at any point. Maybe if, it, if you have a, a comfortable lead at some point in the second half, you throw him in there and just see what he can do. But uh, we're getting pretty deep into the weeds there. By the way. Uh, before we get out of here, I wanted to ask you, uh, what did you think of the, of the Big Ten awards that came out yesterday? Any major qualms with those? Um, not particularly. I mean, I, at first I was a little surprised that they gave Big Ten Freshman of the Year to, to Iggy Brasdakis over Romeo, but I, I get it. Yeah. I mean, Michigan had a better season than Indiana, and Iggy is one of their best players. He had a very good season. So I get it. I think there was a strong case that Romeo should have won it, but I, you know, again, I get it. Yeah, uh, I think he I, mean, I, think, I think Matt Painter was the, the obvious choice for player of the year, and I've been on, since mid-season, since sometime in January, I've been saying that, I, that Cassius Winston was my pick for Big Ten player of the year, so I think that was the right choice. Yeah, I remember you telling me that very early on in the season, and, and he kind of rode that out and finish strong it also helps that Carson Edwards and any or I guess Carson Edwards in particular you know kind of tailed off a little bit after an early start I think that opened the door for Winston a little bit he is really good I mean of of the guys that we've seen in person I gotta say Cassius Winston is probably the the best hit you know him Edwards or Ethan Happ those those three guys are, yeah. are pretty unbelievable the one the one big quibble I had was Lamar Stevens on the first team I yeah, just that one that one confused I gotta be honest that, that one confused me a little bit as well. I mean, I, I had him, I bumped him up to the third team. I kind of just did this fake ballot on my, on my computer just for fun. Um, I bumped him up to the third team like late in the process because I just didn't feel like there were that many strong options and Penn State kind of surged to close the year. So I wanted to reward them. But I did not think that he had a first team caliber season. And I was really surprised that the voters went that direction given the fact that Penn State's not an elite team and, uh, you know, he kind of struggles with efficiency. He, he's, he's not an efficient scorer at all. And if, you're, if that's what he kind of brings to the table and he doesn't even do it efficiently. I don't know. I was just a little confused by that. Uh, I also thought Jawan Morgan maybe deserved a little bit more love. I think the way he's closed the season, uh, his, his steadiness all season. But I do get the fact that Indiana was pretty disappointing. And it's hard to put two guys on, or I guess even one guy, on, a, on an all-Big Ten team. Yeah, I agree. I'm not totally sure who I, I guess when you're looking at the coaches selections for the first team all Big Ten, I you could slot Xavier Simpson in there. Yeah. Or or Jordan I think Simpson or Jordan Murphy are probably the two guys you could bump up in place of Lamar Stevens. He had a good season though, so he did. I, I would just I, I I guess if I'm looking at a first option score, I would want them to, to be a little bit better than forty nine percent true shooting. But maybe that's yeah. just me. Maybe maybe uh maybe I value the, that, that sort of thing more than the typical person. Another thing was I was surprised that John Teske was not on the uh, first team all defense. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a case there too. So anyway, we did not have official ballots, obviously. Um, yeah. But we, we do like to opine on these things. We've, you know, having seen a lot of these guys up close and in person, we will see even more of them up close and in person this coming week. We will, be at the Big Ten tournament on Thursday through Friday, or I guess Thursday through Sunday, um, regardless of how Indiana does in the tournament. Uh, obviously, if they get past Ohio State in the first round, they would have Michigan State in the second. Tough to beat a, a good team three times, but Indiana might have a shot to do it. We will keep you posted uh, with coverage from Chicago all week long. So until then, stay tuned, and we'll talk to you later. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU Hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink.
We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers. <laughs>